Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you can see here, and as promised uh, from last uh, lecture, uh, we're going to cover MLA's eighth edition for formatting and style guide. So, MLA, as we touched upon in the last lecture, is, stands for Modern Language Association. Uh, they update it every few years. This happens to be the eighth edition they're up to. Uh, so, what they do is they dictate what a paper in an English class at a university or college level, so a post secondary level, what it's supposed to look like, how to cite uh, the various authorities that you're going to directly quote, paraphrase, or summarize within your essay uh, in order to give it credence, uh, and how your works cited page is supposed to correspond to the in-text citations. So it's going to be important that you understand those two terms moving forward, uh, the works cited page and the entries on the works cited page, and then the in-text citations that correspond to it. The in-text citations are going to be within the text, meaning within the body of the essay, and then they correspond to entries on the works cited page. But we're going to cover a lot of that uh, within this essay, or sorry, within this lecture. And uh, I'm going to provide next class an example. Uh, of, well, as we move forward, I am going to provide an example of a personal essay next class, but you're also going to get an example um, later on uh, of a student, uh, good, you know, solid student writing uh, that has a works cited page that corresponds to the uh, in-text citation. And remember, this is going to be MLA is going to be a, an important component uh, of how I grade and, and observe your essays and mark them. So uh, it's important that you watch this, take notes, um, come back to it if you have to. Uh, and uh, and yeah, it's kind of boring, it's kind of redundant, but it's important. So let's move forward. Okay, you can uh, as you can see here, you can use uh, Purdue uh, that I mentioned before, uh, Google Purdue Out MLA, and it'll take you directly to the website. It has uh, drop-down menus and various examples. And you know what? I'm going to email with this link. I'm going to email you that great example of an essay uh, that we were supposed to look at. Uh, it was a student's essay they had written uh, a few semesters ago. I thought it was excellent in terms of a personal essay. And it's really sound with regard to how she formatted it. It's completely uh, well done with regard to MLA. Uh, so use that as an example. It doesn't have a work cited. We haven't gotten to that point yet. We will with our expository essay. We'll move on to that next week. Um, so we'll be able to sort of understand and have a visual cue of what it looks like. Also, uh, MLA, as I mentioned before, is an integral part of my, my grading scheme, too, for our papers within this class. Uh, so refer to the rubric uh, that I attached in Blackboard. I, I sent it to you as well uh, to be outside of the semester. No, but it's, if you can't find any emails, it's definitely in Blackboard. Go to our, our page, our Blackboard page on the left-hand side. It says rubric. And within it, when you open it, it's a Word document. It'll show you uh, that MLA is a, is a big part of an A paper. It's a big part of a B paper. You know, as we get to the C and D level, uh, the, the, the MLA starts waning. People start not integrating it properly within their paper, and then the paper drops to that level. So that's going to be a big part of uh, how I grade your papers moving forward uh, this semester. Uh, also, at the very bottom, uh, you can go to... You can see this web link, uh, style.mla.org, and you'll be able to find plenty of information that will guide you with your with regard to your MLA and how your paper is supposed to look. Okay, so what does MLA actually do? What does it dictate with regard to what our paper is supposed to look like? A number of things. You can see them here. MLA regulates the document document format. So where do you put your name? Where do you put my name? Where do you put the class name? Where do you put your header with your page number? Uh, where's the works cited go? How's it formatted? Uh, here, what? We're going to, the second bullet point here, in-text citations, also called um, parenthetical citations, but for the, they're synonymous as two words, in-text and parenthetical. Uh, so when we move on to our expository, we didn't have to do any in-text citations or that correspond to a works cited page for this paper, for this personal uh, essay. Uh, but we will move forward to our um, uh, expository essay and then an argumentative essay and then the final essay. Uh, and then how does a works cited list, what does it look like, works cited? Uh, and when we do works cited, when we do a works cited page, this is erroneous right here. They, they're hyphenating it, works cited with a hyphen in the middle. We're not going to do that. So just as a quick overview, uh, this presentation will cover uh, how to format a paper in MLA, the general guidelines, the first page format, section headings, the in-text citations, the formatting of quotations, right? This is going to be a very integral part of your expository essay and your argumentative essay and your final essay. Uh, documenting sources. So the core elements list the works cited. Again, as you can see here, they did not, they chose not to hyphenate works cited here, which is the correct way. And although uh, MLA gives us the general guidelines, uh, the basic rule for formatting any style uh, for your English papers is always follow uh, your instructor's guidelines, always follow my guidelines. I part ways in some ways with what MLA 
tells us or dictates what a paper supposed to look supposed to look like so i want to stream it down make it easier for everyone it's just some of it just is not required and we're, we're looking at some of those in a moment but the basic and general guidelines and i think most of us are familiar with this and most word documents default to these settings is as follows uh the paper should be white 8.5 by 11 uh paper double space everything so highlight everything at the end right before you turn it in right sorry right before you print it off well we're not gonna put it off in this class right before you upload it Highlight everything and then double space it. Uh, if it looks like there's a lot of spacing and it's wonky, refer back to that paper, that, uh, that best essay example for a personal essay that I that I'm going to email you with uh, within this uh, when I send this link out, and it's in Blackboard as well on the left hand side. Uh, compare it to that line spacing because that's correct line spacing. Leave only one space after punctuation. I'm not concerned about that. I'm not going to pull out a ruler and then measure your punctuation if it's spaced properly. Uh, set all margins to one inch on all sides. I am going to be concerned about this. I I mean, you could eyeball a paper and tell if it's one inch margins, but individuals have tinkered with the margins in the past because they haven't met the threshold for three to five pages double spaced for the final uh, for the final draft of your essay. And so maybe they had two pages and so or two and a half pages. So they pull the margins in, uh, to, which pushes the, the words on sep on to greater uh, page numbers. So they're trying to make that three page threshold. Right. Uh, so they can get at least get in the door with regard to the gr being graded right so don't tinker with the margins just leave them at one inch uh they should be set at default one inch uh email me if you have any questions about how to set any of these uh settings up uh indent the first line of paragraphs at one half inch i'm not gonna be concerned about i am going to be concerned about the ind indentation of every new paragraph but i'm not going to really care about if it's a half inch uh they typically uh, word document marks of word is pretty intuitive once you tab over or indent the first paragraph, it pretty much it picks up on it and starts to indent for you. Uh, other format and guidelines for general guidelines for MLA. Uh, the paper should have a header with page numbers located in the upper right-hand corner. We're going to look at an example of this in a moment. And that all this is is your last name, uh, Smith, and then a space, and then the page number, page one. But that page number has to increase as each page increases. I've seen many papers where they turn in, uh, they have their last name, and then it's just page one on page one. Then I turn to page two and it's page one. Then I turn to page three and it's page one. So the pagination didn't didn't increase incrementally like it should. You got to make sure that it does. Uh, use italics for titles of this is a very important point. And we're going to go over this in a moment and look at an example. But use italics, so italicized titles of container works. So the container work is the bigger work. So a book is a container work. Um, the name of a website is a container work. An article that you read on a website, the name of that article would be quotation marked because it's the smaller increment. It's not the container work, right? A chapter within a book would be quotation marked. It's the smaller within a container, right? The book itself would be title would be italicized. The chapter within it would be uh, quotation marked. Place endnotes on a separate page before the list of works cited. We're not going to do endnotes, so disregard that last bullet point. Uh, some of this, these points here we went over uh, in the prior slide, but the first page of an MLA style paper will have no title page so your english papers that you turn in within this class within the purview and confines and perimeters of this class will have no title page that's apa that's chicago that's some other style formatting for other classes but this class and within this class we cannot turn in a paper that has a white a white page in front of your essay and you just have the title of, of the essay we're not doing that all right you must double space everything list your name this is on the left hand side list your name your instructor's name, so me, uh, the course, English 252, and the date in the upper left-hand corner. And the date should be in proper formatted. It should be formatted with the day, the written out month, and then the year. Uh, center the paper uh, title. Uh, so use standard caps, but no underlining, italics, quotation marks, or bold typeface. So your title, every major word in your title of your essay should be capitalized. Uh, and then with nothing else done to it, no bold, no underlining, no italics, it needs to be sans all that uh, create a header in the upper right hand corner we already went over this at a half inch from the top and one inch from the right of the page so when we create a header you just go into work uh, microsoft word uh, let me just pull one up microsoft word you go to insert at the top right near home uh, scroll over to page number scroll down to uh, the first one top of page and then you scroll down to the third one plain number three and that makes it on the right hand side your header and he's a, a page number automatically appears page one you type in your last name smith put a space and then hit the red x on top 
to close out of there. And then you have your proper page numbering. Uh, let's see. And that needs, as I said before, the page numbering needs to increase as each page increases. And this is just formatting for the first page. Uh, so let's move on. Okay, so here's a sample um, of a, the first page of your English essay. All right, so as you can see here to the top or top left, you get the student's name. In this case, it's Charlotte Lucas. Uh, then you have Dr. J. Austin. That is the instructor, the professor for the class. Then you have the name in the class, English 106. All right, in our case, English, E-N-G-L space 252. You could spell out English, the whole word, E-N-G-L-I-S-H, uh, and then space 252, if you wish. That's okay. And then here's the date. Look at the date formatting. It has to be, this is proper MLA date formatting. This is correct. So 12 space, the full month written out. So in this case, October space, and then the full year. We don't want to see any abbreviation of October or any abbreviation of the year where we just put 20, right? Uh, and then the top right, we get the author of this paper, the student, their last name, Lucas, space, page one. Right under the date, right, right under the date on the left-hand side, they did one space, and then they put the title of their, or their essay. Every major word is capitalized within the title, so building a dream, colon, uh, reasons to expand Ross A Stadium. Uh, so every major word, and then they, is, is uh, capitalized, and then they hit enter once, and then they indented and they started their essay, right? They got us, they got us, gave us a hook of some sort, a stat or something, brought us into the, into the essay somehow, right? Pulled us in. And this first paragraph would have distilled down to our, their thesis statement, what the whole paper is about, and it would have summarized the main points that it wants to talk about within the essay. And then the essay would have unfolded in the order that they summarized the points, right? The strongest point to the weakest point, distilling down to the weakest point. We haven't gotten to that point yet because we've just written a personal essay, and the personal essay, as we know, doesn't necessarily have a, a thesis statement. It doesn't hit us over the head and tell us, hey, within this essay, I'm going to talk about this X, Y, and Z, right? But our paper is moving forward. will do so. Uh, so in, please, again, refer back to that example that I emailed, that I'm going to email you today, uh, of a great personal essay example, and it is properly uh, formatted. Notice that the title is, has nothing nothing that's done to it that makes it, that sets it aside other than it's centered, right? It's not bold, it's not underlined, it's not italicized, uh, so just bear that in mind. Okay, so formatting section headings. I probably should delete this, but it's, I guess it's good to know because we're not going to use it in this class, but maybe it's good to know for future essays when you have to really do a long uh, research essay that's you know, 10, 15, 20 pages long, uh, that you might have section headings to break it down for the, for the reader, uh, for the person that's assessing its credibility as an English paper. Uh, and it just breaks different sections down incrementally, um, truncating them uh, so that an instructor can read this essay, walk away from it, come back to it, just finish off one one section uh, and then come back and then maybe each section is uh, is sort of like a mosaic uh, one section is talking about one aspect of a subject matter the next section is talking about another aspect of the subject matter and all these pieces marry together somehow like a mosaic but we're not for the for uh, all intents and purposes for this class we're not going to have section headings so don't worry about this we briefly uh, touched upon this earlier an in-text citation what is it? It's a brief reference in your text to indicate the source you consulted. So this will become important, not for your personal essays, not, but definitely when we get into the expository from every essay moving forward past the personal essay. The in-text citation should direct readers to the entry in your work cited list for that source. It should be unobtrusive, meaning it doesn't get in the way itself, doesn't foreground itself on the on the page where we where we have to really try to break it down and understand what it is. MLA does a really good job of streamlining and strip it down uh, in-text citation and work cited so that's simple to read. It doesn't get in the way. It doesn't add to your page, or sorry, to your, your um, word count, really. Uh, provide the citation information without interrupting your own text. Uh, so it needs to be as little as possible on the page. Uh, and to do so, we do the very last bullet point here. In general, the in-text citation will be the author's last name or abbreviated title with the page number enclosed in parentheses. So we're gonna look at an example of this in a moment. Just, just remember, it's not that hard. Uh, one, if you think about it like this, you're going to go out there, you're going to do research for your for your expository essay, which only job is to inform. And we're going to get a, a, a lecture on that uh, next class. But the only job of expository essay is to inform the reader on some subject matter that you research. Uh, and you're going to borrow from outside authorities because you're not necessarily the authority on the subject matter, right? So if I want to sort of do an expository essay on 
how a prime minister gets elected. What is the process, right? That's one aspect of expository's process. What is the process for a prime minister to get elected to office, right? Uh, I'm gonna have to, have to borrow from outside authority. I'm gonna look up government websites uh, to see how they get elected, what the process is, how many years they can serve. Do they have to serve at, as a premier first or a senator, or, you know, governor or whatever. Uh, and then I'm gonna give it attribution. I'm gonna say according to, uh, to Mike Jones, uh, a leading expert in, in prime, minister, prime minister campaigns, says, quote, to get elected as a prime minister, you need to do X, Y, and Z, unquote. All right, and then I'm gonna have to have the in-text citation. In this case, I mentioned the author my, or who said this, this quote, Mike Jones. I mentioned it in the setup for the quote, uh, but if I didn't mention it, if I just said to get elected as prime minister, you need to, quote, uh, run a campaign that is able to successfully beat out your competitor, your rival, unquote. Then you would have the in-text citation, right? It's a parentheses, open parentheses, author's last name. In this case, remember it was Mike Jones. I would just put Jones, last name, right? No comma, no punctuation uh, within in-text citation, uh, except for when you use at all. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, and then you would put, you put Jones. If there's a page number, you put a page number, page seven, close the parentheses, then period. Typically, in our day and age, and we're going to touch on this in a moment, we don't do Gone are the days that we go to a brick and mortar library to do research, right? We do everything online with databases. We do everything online with websites, right? So, and typically websites don't have page numbers. So if you don't can't find a page number, you exclude it. If you can't find uh, an author's last name, uh, then you use what they say here in the parentheses here, abbreviated title with quotation marks. And we're getting into that in a moment. We're gonna look at an example. All right, here's a few examples of how this author, whoever assembled this on the page, uh, wanted to integrate the in-text citation. There's a couple different methodologies, ways to approach this, as you can see here. So let's go, just, I'll go ahead and read it and we'll break it down. Wordsworth stated that romantic poetry was marked by a quote, spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, unquote. And then we get the in-text citation and then the period. The in-text citation here is 263, so page 263. Notice they didn't put a P for page or spell out page in the in-text citation. When I see a number in the in-text citation, I know, I know that's a page number, right? So we don't have to put page or anything. MLA says, don't put the word page, don't put a P and then a period. Don't put any punctuation except when you use it at all. Uh, why didn't we use Wordsworth? Since we're quoting Wordsworth, right? Wordsworth said spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Why didn't we put Wordsworth in the in-text citation? The answer is because we use Wordsworth in the setup for the quote. We said Wordsworth stated that romantic poetry was marked by, quote, spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, unquote. Uh, then the in-text citation and the period. All right. The next one, we have, we don't, we're not using Wordsworth in the setup for the quote or the paraphrase. So we have to put Wordsworth in the in-text citation. Romantic poetry is characterized by the, quote, spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, unquote. So now we get the in-text citation with the author, who, what, who, the person who was quoted, Wordsworth, uh, and then the space, make sure you put the space between that and the page number, then the page number, close the uh, parentheses, the in-text citation, then period. And then we get the last one again, it's just, it's just um, this one's a paraphrase, uh, but they're mentioning Wordsworth in the setup for the paraphrase. Uh, so in the in-text citation, we only need the page number. Wordsworth extensively explored the role of emotions in the creative process. So with a the paraphrasing, they're taking what they read about what Wordsworth said. They're ingesting it as, as an author of an essay, right? And then they're spitting the words out in their own words, right? They're not, uh, it's not verbatim. Therefore, it's not a direct quote, it's just paraphrase. What you're gonna do both, I think, I think the best essays do both. You're gonna turn in essays this semester that are gonna directly quote a source, an outside authority, outside of yourself, outside your own purview. Um, and then you're gonna also paraphrase outside authorities and integrate the general spirit of what they said into your essay and not necessarily directly quote them, but you will directly quote as well. Uh, and notice at the very bottom, this is, will be what's on the works cited page, right? Uh, with every essay moving forward besides the personal essay, it doesn't have a works cited page. So Wordsworth, the last name of the author, comma, first name of the author, William, period, the book. So we know it's a book because it's italicized. It, it's kind of hard to see, but it's there. My eyes are trained to see italicized words, but it's italicized, everything's slanting slightly to the right. Uh, it's a container work, it's the bigger work, right? Lyrical ballads, uh, Oxford is the press, uh, and then the date it was published. I mean, we, we touched upon this in the prior slide, but it's worth driving the point home to just to reiterate it. Uh, 
so this is the the following is a print source. You might have a print source, meaning a book, a magazine, a journal. Uh, you may not. So if the essay provides a signal word or phrase, usually the author's last name, the citation does not need to also include that information. So if you mention, for the example here, this the first top part in the blue, Burke, uh, comma, Kenneth, period, is what's going to be on your works cited page, right? Uh, but the example at the bottom is how are you going to integrate Kenneth Burke, that author who said something, who was quoted as saying something? How are you going to quote, how are you going to set them up, set their integrate their name within the actual your actual text within your essay and these are a couple examples we just mentioned this with wordsworth you can include wordsworth in the setup you can include kenneth burke in the setup for the quote in which case you don't have to include it you do not have to include it in the in-text citation so the first example humans have been described by kenneth burke as quote symbol using animals unquote so what now we just get the page number for the in-text citation and then the punctuation the period the reason we put the period after the in-text citation is so that I know everything on the left side of the period is what this in-text citation is for, right? If you put the period before the in-text citation, then I think three goes with the next line. It's gonna be about the right. So make sure you put the period, the punctuation after the in-text citation. Uh, the very bottom example is if we don't use Burke, we don't set up the quote with Burke's name, right? So we don't use attribution. We don't say according to Kenneth Burke, a leading expert in the field of, I don't know, symbol using animals i don't know so uh so in the event that we don't use an attribution I mean, i implore you to use attribution i think it's, it's better and it forms the reader right away it qualifies the expert by saying they're a leading expert in the field of x y and z right you're saying according to so i know exactly who's talking it's not you talking it's them at that point when you quote them or paraphrase them so let's look at the very bottom one humans have been described as quote symbol using animals unquote burke page three in text citation then punctuation so burke because they didn't use burke in the setup for the quote that was symbol using animals we had to use burke the the originator of that quote that direct quote we had to use burke in the in-text citation with the page number as you go through the process of sort of self-vetting uh various websites you know part of the component of this class is doing research so it is reaching out to the academic databases uh the more academic uh websites that exist out there and that's partly you have to vet that yourself or reach out to me to help you vet that but we are going to get a, a lecture on databases uh, but as you go out there and research uh you're going to have a situation where you might be on a government website so canada.ca canada stats you know when you reach out there to do research you're going to find that on a government website on a on a uh college or university website on many websites that exist out there dot orgs a lot of dot orgs dot edus dot govs dot ca uh, they're not going to have any authors no authorship on it we're going to get a great stat we're going to get a great quote off of there be like man i really want to use this but i don't see any author who wrote this how do i cite it right well that's going to happen a lot this semester for you uh, and in your future writing and researching uh, it's just the way it goes in our day and age that you don't see authorship a lot you have to trust the, the site when it's a government website or a university website and most likely a, a dot org website or other websites and databases for sure that we look at this semester uh, but when you don't have the author you can't mention an author so what do you do well when you can't don't have an author you have to include an in-text citation because it has to correspond to an entry on your work cited page uh, so you use the you use the title of the article that you read so in this case the title is impact of global warming you see at the very end of this passage this paragraph right this paraphrase or sorry it is a quote this quote uh and if the title is really long like we we're going to see in a moment this is a much larger title you have to reduce it down to three words right the first three words don't just pick and choose the three words but the first three words of the title of the article that you read that you used a quote from so this one's impacted global warming. We're seeing a moment that it was like three or four more words longer, but they shortened it. So how does site work with no known author? I'm just reading from the top. We see, uh, this is a quote, or this is in an essay. We see so many global warming hotspots in North America, likely because this region has, quote, more readily accessible climatic data and more comprehensive programs to monitor and study environmental change, unquote. And then that was the quote. And then we get the actual title of the article in the absence of not having an author. And anytime you use a title in an in-text citation because you can't find, couldn't find an author, you have to put quotation marks around it to let me know that it's the title of the article. And then, of course, they included the page number. And maybe you don't have a page number. If you can't find a page number, you don't include a page number. And here, as we said before, uh, in the prior slide, we got the actual quote that they used. 
and then the short title with quotation marks in the in-text citation because we didn't have an author. And here is, it is, is the actual corresponding entry on the works cited page. It would be the impact of global warming in North America. So you see they shortened it to the impact of global warming in the in the in-text citation, right? Because you don't want it to be too clunky and in the way like, like we said, MLA doesn't want to do. It wants to be unobtrusive. So that you shorten it to three. It corresponds to this works cited page. Your works cited page has to be in alphabetical order. So in this case, the T and the, you would have to alphabetize against any other entry you had on your works cited page. Um, global warming, early signs. Uh, this could be a website. It could be a book. It's italicized. Uh, so it's a larger container. It's either a book or a website. And then the date. Okay, so there's one isolated single solitary situation in which you will use punctuation within your in-text citation. That's when you use et al. And et al is when we have three or more authors uh, that you don't want to list it, the three authors in in inside your text, inside your in-text citation or inside your body of your essay, right? It's just too much. It would be too much to write Smith, uh, Jones, and, and I don't know, uh, Jackson. Right, all three of those names as authors, right? So you reduce it down. Say there was five authors, you wouldn't want to list all those authors in your in-text citation. It would just be too big, too clunky. Um, it would be too much in the way in the in the paper. You do have to list all of the authors on your works cited page, right? We never put at all on our works cited page. We only put at all when there's three or more authors. We want to use a quote or a paraphrase that three or more authors wrote as part of an article of some sort. Uh, but we wouldn't use the lead author. So in this case, it would be Smith. So let's look at an example. Smith et al. argues that tougher gun control is not needed in the United States. Uh, so we use Smith et al. in the setup for the paraphrase here. So we did not have to include it in the in-text citation. We just included 76, the page number, right? In the second example, the author state, quote, and this is fine if you set up a quote right here with either a comma or a colon. In this case, they use the colon. Uh, they could easily use the comma. The author state, comma i would use the colon like they did i think it's stronger that big pause we know they're about to have a have a quote for us uh the authors state quote tighter gun control in the united states erodes second amendment rights unquote we didn't mention the at all or smith they just mentioned the general idea of the authors so we have to mention in the in-text citation here smith at all so smith space at all dot so the period the one time we put punctuation in the in-text space page number that 76 close the in-text period. Then we get our punctuation after uh, the in-text citation cl uh, closes. At the very bottom, uh, when you have two authors, list both authors' last names in the in-text citation. A 2016 study suggests that stricter gun control in the United States will significantly prevent accidental shootings. And here we get the in-text citation because we know there were two authors. Had there been three authors or more, we would have had to put strong at all. But there were two authors, strong and Ellis, Type in Strong and Ellis, page 23, close it out. Maybe there wasn't a page number. You don't put a page number. Uh, don't and Notice they used the and. They spelled out and. And uh, they didn't use the symbol for and, which was the ampersand symbol. Don't use ampersand. I'd rather just go with, we all just use and uh, within if we have two authors. If we run across a situation where we have, we want to quote uh, a paper that there are two authors in it. The, this, the first example, and that's really one we're going to focus on here, it, it's not common. Uh, and if you do run across, across it where you're quoting someone who's, who's, who's quoting that person, I say always try to go to the original source. And it's, I see this often that, or I see the idea often that people don't go to the original source. Hardly do I see them using this correctly. But if you have to, if someone said, if someone quoted someone else and you wanted to use that, go to the original source. In this case, well, let's just go ahead and read it. Ravitch argues that high schools are pressured to act as, quote, social service centers, and they don't do uh, that well. Uh, quoted, and we see the in-text citation is the lowercase qtd, period. Okay, there you go. There's another example of punctuation uh, within an in-text citation. This is hardly ever, we hardly ever see this if we quote someone else in a quote. Uh, so this was quoted in Weissman, page 259. I would say... Um, Instead of quoting Weissman, go directly to the original source of Ravitch saying, quote, social service centers, and they don't do well at that. Schools are social service centers, and they don't do well at that. Um, instead of quoting Weissman, who's quoting Ravitch, right? It just gets very convoluted and messy when you quote someone quoting someone else. In this case, Weissman quoting Ravitch. So we see this often on um, 
uh, so with Wikipedia, I think it's a great, I think it's a great place to start. I'm on, I'm on Wikipedia all day long sometimes reading articles. It's a great place to start to get information, your general information. Uh, but it's a bad place to quote. We never quote Wikipedia. I don't want you even quoting dictionary.com uh, or md.com or any of those WebMD. There you go. Uh, go to the original source. Find a more bona fide source of someone who, who we can see as an expert in the field who's, who's quoting, right? Um, so I don't know the qualifications of Weissman. If had I maybe they qualified Ravitcher, you know, maybe that would be better. But we see this often. You can go to Wikipedia. You could read an article that you want to use. You could read, sorry, you could read a quote off of Wikipedia. Like, wow, this is a really good quote. I want to use this to really underscore my point that I'm trying to make within my argumentative essay, uh, or my expository essay, or a research essay. And it's a great quote. It has everything to do with what your paper's about, right? But you can't say according to Wikipedia, right? You're not going to ever use Wikipedia as a source. What you will do is every quote within Wikipedia, typically 99% of the time, but there's that small percentage where it doesn't include uh, a, a number. In, in brackets, right next to the quote in Wikipedia, there's a number. You click on that, it takes you down to the references at the very bottom, really large list typically of references where Wikipedia pulled those sources from the internet somewhere. And then you go, you click on the reference that's corresponding to your quote, and it'll take you to that direct quote from that individual. So maybe that's what they should have done here instead of quote it in Weissman 259. Go directly to the Ravage source instead of Weissman. I typically and historically haven't seen people use a lot of time-based media, uh, but it's becoming more and more common uh, within my classes. Uh, and that's fine. You can use that. If you're writing an pa argumentative paper, an expository paper, and you got some expert in the field of your subject matter to and you found a really great great quote on youtube you know or a ted talk let's say a ted talk on a ted talk video that was on youtube fine i would say go to the original this is a good example go to the original source of the ted talk online instead of quoting a youtube video but if you do quote something that's multimedia if you pull an excerpt or a direct quote or a paraphrase that's something that's time-based media multimedia such as a ted talk um that's fine so here you would see they use the title of the article. In this case, it's Hush in the first example. Buffy's, prom Buffy's promise that, quote, there's not going to be any incidents like at my old school, unquote, is obviously not one in which she can follow through. So we get the name of the article, the multimedia, the name of the episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, where the quote came from. So in this case, the name of the episode was Hush. Uh, and then we get the timestamp of uh, where in the actual video did she say this? Did Buffy quote this? There's not going to be any incidents like at my old school. Uh, so if you're watching a TED Talk and you want to pull a quote from there, make sure we know the name of the TED Talk in quotation marks to let us know it's a title, right? And then the timestamp of when they said it. That's really all you need uh, to quote something that is time-based media. Okay, so we touched upon this before. Sources without page numbers. Uh, it might be very common, right? Especially things that are based in, in um, online, right? Uh, on the World Wide Web. Uh, disability, this first example, disability activism uh, should work toward, quote, creating a habitable space for all beings, unquote. Uh, we get the author here. In this case, the author has two last names. It's hyphenated. We know that. Uh, Garland Thompson. Uh, Thompson, there you go. Uh, then you close the in-text citation with parentheses, and then you get your punctuation. Um, we don't have a page number, so a page number is not forced into this. You're not going to just make up a page number or put zero or... Just all we do is list the author's last name if there is an author. If we don't have an author, what do we have to do? We have to list the title of the article, uh, an abbreviated title if it's more than four words. Uh, so the corresponding work cited to this in-text citation, Garland Thompson, would be Garland Thompson, period, the individual's first name, Rosemary in this case, uh, close or period to close out the author's name, right? Then the title of the article we get here, Habitable Worlds. And then we get the title of the bigger container, whether that's a website or a book. In this case, it's Critical Disability Studies Symposium. So it was from a symposium. But I think the most important thing to remember is uh, if there isn't a page number, you can't list it. If there isn't an author, but you want to use the quote or paraphrase or, summar or summary, uh, then you have to use uh, the title of the article. And if it's a really long title, like four or five words, shorten it down to three, the first three. And we're, we're sort of kind of reiterating what we spoke about like four or five slides ago, it's so like 10 minutes ago. Uh, still short prose quotation. Prose is just think about it as this 
text, a regular essay that you're reading or a journal article or online article that you're reading. Uh, it's not poetry, right? So, uh, prose is the opposite of poetry. So the first example, according to some, dreams express, quote, the profound aspects of personality, unquote. Uh, folks, 184, though others disagree. So this is perfectly fine. I would say if it's not a long sentence, put folks 184 at the very end, as we're going to see in an example in a moment. Uh, but they put it, they they cut their quote, after the quote, they cut their sentence in half by putting the in-text citation in the middle or towards the middle. Uh, folks 184, that's okay. Uh, but you could put it at the end. I think it's better to put it at the end if you can. If the sentence goes it meanders on for another couple lines, then yeah, I guess put the, your in-text citation right after the quote. Uh, but you're safe to put it at the end. According to, here's the second example, the one in the middle. According to Folk's study, dreams may express, quote, profound aspects of personality. So unlike the first example, <clears throat> we get, or sorry, yeah, we get Folk's in the setup, the attribution here. And I agree, I, again, I want you, the best essays moving forward outside the personal essay um, is going to be you incorporating, um, I believe, attribution. Right. Those are the best essays saying so and so stated or according to um, they said, quote, then you give us the quote, then you give us the in-text citation. Since we use folks, the, the person who is the uh, person who said this profound aspects of personality, they were the person who said this direct quote. We don't have to put folks in the in-text citation. We just get the page number. Um, and then the last example, it is possible that dreams may express, quote, profound aspects of personality. They did not mention folks in the attribution, in the setup, right? Um, so they included the author's last name here. Uh, the better, and they don't list it here, but the better example would be to qualify, to give attribution and qualify folks, and then just use the page number. So I would say according to folks, this study, or according to folks, uh, a PhD in, um, I don't know, um, in the field of X, dreams may express express quote profound aspects of personality and then you just get page 184. Uh, so we set it up by giving the attribution according to folks comma and then we tell them us you tell the reader why he or she is an expert in the field all right we qualify them and that really makes it more believable that they're uh that it's worthwhile to incorporate this quote as they are a leading expert in this field of some sort this may come up and i would say use this with great economy meaning don't use it a lot you might use it once within a paper because these are called block quotes. If you use a block quote, um, if you're quote, quoting for, uh, more than four lines of prose, more than four lines of a text that you read that you really think it has everything to do with your subject matter, you want to quote this within your essay, but it's four lines or more, so it's really big. It takes up so much room uh, in your essays that, that you can start to see in a three to five page essay, double spaced. If you do three or four of these, your essay is done, but you haven't written the essay. These block quotes have really written your essay, right? So avoid these, I would say. Um, Use great economy and uh, use these judiciously and sparingly. So in this case, uh, you can see the quote. Every time you use a block quote, it's going to look like this. Every time. You get the setup. Nellie Dean treats Heathcliff poorly and dehumanizes him throughout her narrations. You get the colon af after the setup for the block quote. Then you get the block quote. It has to indent twice. right? You normally indent once. We see the indentation. You really can't see it, but before... Nellie Dean. There's an indentation that you have at the beginning of every paragraph that you write. Uh, then you have to indent even twice or once more uh, so that it differentiates, differentiates itself from uh, the beginning of the sentence that, for the setup. But you're always going to have the colon after the setup. You can indent one more time and then you're going to put your quote in. And notice the block quote does not have, it's absent of quotation marks, right? I know it's a block quote for a number of reasons. I know it's a block quote because it's indented over more than the regular sentence uh, for the setup. I know it's a block quote because it's more than four lines. And I know it's a block quote because there aren't any quotation marks. And finally, I know it's a block quote because it ends with a period. And then we get the insect in text citation, right? Uh, th what we were doing before with a regular quote with three lines or less was we would... Uh, have the uh, in-text citation after the quote, and then we would get the punctuation. In this case, the punctuation goes first, and then we get the the source. In this case, is Bronte is the author uh, space and the page number. And again, if, if this seems too complicated, uh, just don't use them. Just break it down into multiple quotes instead of one giant quote. Okay, so you might 
come across a situation where you want to add or you want to take out or omit words, in which case you use two things, brackets and the ellipses, the three dots, right? So if you want to uh, add information, typically you only add information, like a journalist, you ever read a journalistic article from a newspaper, a journal of some sort, uh, and they want to clarify. Uh, if there's, if you got a quote from someone or you, someone, an, a journalist got a quote uh, and they want to use the quote, uh, but they get back to the office to type out this this article and they realize that it doesn't make sense. Some of the language in it is missing. So they have to add their own language to clarify. And when you do that, you have to throw brackets around it within the quote. Uh, and that tells the reader that you're just adding this information to clarify to you, but it's not the original person who said it. So in this case, uh, Jan Harold Brunvund in an essay on urban legends states, quote, some individuals who retell urban legends make a point of learning every rumor or tale. Then since we got Jan Harold Brunvund in the setup for the quote, we don't need his last name, Brunvund, here. I assume it's a, it could be, it's, it's androgynous, the name. I don't know if it's a man or a woman. Well, I got Harold as the middle name, so it's a man. Uh, so, yeah, so if you want to clarify information, you use, you put out, you use your voice, but make sure it's in brackets, right? Uh, in this second example here, if you want to omit words, so you if you read um, this giant paragraph and you're like, wow, this paragraph is great at the beginning. I want to use that quote and it's great at the end. I want to use that quote, but everything in the middle doesn't really have to do with the subject matter of my essay, of my expository essay. So you could throw that out and join those two quotes, in this case, with ellipses. That means you're omitting information. Um, or you could just put a period after tail, rumor or tail, period, then and close the quotation marks and then start a new, and then say, Brunvard goes on to say, and then quote him again. You can do it that way as well. Or you can use ellipses to join to show that you've taken out a lot of information, you've omitted it uh, for the sake of space and time, and because it had nothing to do with your subject matter, because you wanted to use the beginning of that quote and the end of the quote, and you smash them together with the ellipses. Really, what's an important takeaway from this slide, and we've covered this, but it's going to be a very integral and important and paramount even for you to remember, is that, as you see at the top here, title of source, a book, a website. So the title of a book, the title of a website, it should always be italicized. Uh, periodicals, where I have, the, I have the arrow, blue arrow pointing here in the middle of the page, periodicals, such as journals, uh, magazines, newspaper articles, online articles of any sort, television episodes, songs, should be quotation marked. So the container, the bigger thing, so if you get a quote off a website, the name of the website would be italicized. Within on your works cited page, and then the actual name of the article, the title of the article, would be quotation marked. So we can see it here. Now this is on the works cited page. Uh, first one, we get the name of the author, so last name, comma, first name. We get the name of the article, the smaller container, smaller thing, right? Uh, toward meta reading, right? It's in quotation marks, and then we get the name of the book that they pulled this chapter from or this subheading from, the future of the book. These are in alphabetical order notice, Bazin, Hallmichael, Under the Gun, right? So B, H, U, make sure you um, alphabetize your works cited page, right? Notice here too, uh, we have what's called a hanging indent. So the space after, below Bazin, the space below Hallmichael, and the space below Under the Gun, right? That It's called a, a hanging indent. Uh, so highlight when you want to do, when you're finished with your works cited page, highlight everything on your works cited page, uh, right click into the highlighted area, go to paragraph, uh, scroll down, go to special, and then put in hanging, uh, and then hit uh, OK, and then I'll give you the hanging indent. And it's important, it separates all these three entries from each other, so I know they're separate. Otherwise, they just run together. Uh, but big, big thing to remember here is the bigger thing the bigger container, the book, the name of the, the title of the book or the title of the website needs to be italicized, and the article that you read within the book or within the website needs to be quotation marked. Okay, when you sit down to, actual, to actually craft uh, your essay with your direct quotes or paraphrase or summaries, uh, and, then you, and then your in-text citation, the in-text citation has to correspond to an entry on your works cited page, and you're confused at some point, you don't want to rewatch this video, uh, just go to the end of the video, or near the end, uh, the, the next to last slide, and you can use these great resources. Use these resources to help you create your works cited page. Uh, easybib.com is pretty good. 
uh, citationmachine.net. It's good. Uh, and then just the where I got where I refer back to all the time uh, for the MLA formatting is this website right here. That just Al, uh, just Google Purdue Al if you if you don't want to write this down. So Purdue Al. Um, dot edu google that mla formatting and uh, it'll take you directly to how to format your in-text citation and how that needs to look with regard to how it's corresponding to or marrying up to the works cited page uh, and those are great resources to use okay and always uh questions please email me if you have any questions or concerns or points of clarification if not i'll just talk to you guys look out for your uh your link uh, for your next lecture on Tuesday. Talk to you then. Bye.